I mean, a chairman of Sharp, uh, you do get to design the program. You invite the speakers that you really want to come. And Professor McRae from Boston, who uh, Cal and I have known each other since day one of medical school, and I've been trying to get Cal to come back to Scotland for years, if not decades. And finally, I'm meeting at the Royal College, where we're both fellows and where we both graduated from. Um, it's such a privilege to invite one of America's leading physicians and perhaps America's leading cardiologist to speak here in Edinburgh for Sharp. And so really it's a privilege for the society to have Callum. I know that Victoria was telling me we've got 240 people um, dialing in and registering in online. So although the lucky few are here, there are hundreds out there, Callum, all waiting to hear you. And just a, a moment about Callum, who grew up in Skye in Uig. Uh, we met the first day of medical school, and I really followed Callum's career in my rather in the shadow for decade after decade. Callum's research budget is bigger than Scotland's budget. Is that right? Almost. Um, just about. But what we're going to hear today is a title that I gave Callum, which is about, again, it's about data. It's about the interaction of big data and the global data handlers that really Callum's been working with uh, over, over fairly recent times. And so for the 2021 Sharp Lecture, it is a privilege for Sharp and for myself to invite Professor Callum McCray, Professor of Medicine, Professor of Cardiology at Harvard, Chief of Cardiology at the Brigham, to give the uh, 2021 Sharp Lecture, David on Goliath's Shoulders, How Big Data Will Inform Healthcare. Callum. Thank you very much, Adrian. You generously left out uh, many of the things that I would not wish disclosed. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here. I was given the title, you'll note I uh, removed all the biblical allusions, uh, how big data will inform healthcare. Um, and what I'm gonna try and do is show you how it will hopefully help integrate discovery, translation, and care. Um, here we go. I have some disclosures. Uh, I will tell you that these are actually uh, fairly care carefully calibrated uh, because actually one of my points is going to be the fact that uh, traditional medicine is by design so local that it will never be able to participate. And that unless we find a strategy to actually uh, be, be able to collaborate or ideally industrialize, we're going to end up being left uh, really out in the cold. Uh, the majority of the work that I'll tell you about was uh, today was sponsored by the H.A. Verily, uh, AstraZeneca and Quest Diagnostics. Um, I have some on the right side, some personal commercial uh, interests, but these are only partly reflected and I'll highlight where those are. And ultimately, the theme of the talk is going to be that you can't manage what you can't measure. Um, and the biggest um, conflict is probably academic self-interest. Oops. I'm going to have to go back on this. Let me see. There we go. So I'm going to very quickly go through um, four broad points. One, changing the data we collect. I mentioned in my question to Carmen that uh, fundamentally we're focused on and actually anchored firmly without any deviation from it for about 200 years, things that were uh, essentially instantiated uh, in the Renaissance. Uh, we have to change the scale and scope of what we measure dramatically. Um, if you talk to almost any of the large data uh, handling companies, they will tell you they don't really see any impact until you're measuring about 100 million transactions a day. And we'll come back to the transaction piece uh, as we're talking about creating intelligent systems. Uh, and then ultimately, the single most important piece of this is that, and you heard this, I think Brian uh, Ferns alluded to it this morning, that without actually having the transactions triggered by artificial intelligence, almost none of the possibilities of AI are feasible. You can't optimize against a particular solution. Uh, and again, even there, we tend to optimize against the solutions that we've always optimized against, i.e. tenure uh, risk instead of short-term risk for the individual or very long-term risk for somebody who's very, very young. And then finally, what are the implications for this for how uh, medicine evolves, which at the moment is in a very saltatory fashion through episodic clinical trials, and that itself has some huge uh, limitations, not least the fact that we're largely dependent on external funding and our own individual ideation. And so we're not systematically asking questions across the entire healthcare spectrum about how to use the information that we're collecting, but rather focused on incremental advances in the areas that we've already uh, defined. Now, the data gap is actually quite enormous. This is uh, all of clinical phenotypes. I lead the undiagnosed diseases um, 
effort, at, uh, clinical effort at the uh, Harvard Medical School, uh, part of this national network. Uh, I was asked by the NIH to add up all the possible clinical measurements we could ever make. I added up everything that had ever been recorded in a human being, and it comes to about 10 to the 4 phenotypes. Everybody in the room differs by somewhere in the range of 10 to the 6 uh, single nucleotide variants. So even just to deconvolute common genetics, we'd need to change the scale and scope of what we're measuring by probably five long orders, maybe even a little bit more. And so uh, that's before you start to even think about uh, exposures, which are essentially, we, manage, we measure probably two, unless you uh, happen to have lead measured in your home, it's usually just alcohol and tobacco, and we measure that really precisely by asking people how much they take. Um, and then you think about all of the downstream complexity, including all of the time-dependent phenomena, none of which are actually technically available to the average clinician, and many of which will never be available unless we build completely new tools. At the core, it's really not so much what we collect, it's the information content, and that is rate-limiting in so many parts of medicine. Um, probably the most uh, close to my heart is genetics, where we, we measure things in very small numbers of people that are causal, or we measure common alleles that are very prevalent but have tiny incremental effects, and so uh, really are only useful for very modest uh, risk prediction uh, uh, deployment. And you can see here, actually, this is... Uh, exactly this from Mike Inouye showing that this delta here is the delta between uh, all of the traditional risk factors uh, and a six million marker polygenic risk score. Um, the core elements that we've really focused on, I think, uh, are, as I said earlier, the things that we've always measured. We have not really uh, been able to stratify diseases, despite the fact that I think uh, when Adrian and I were there that first day, it was known as molecular medicine. I think we've changed the name five times, uh, but we haven't really achieved any better precision. And one of the probably key lessons is that in order to be precise, you have to be much, much broader in scale, move towards being comprehensive. Uh, phenotyping uh, itself, uh, but all forms of data collection are, are rate limiting. There's almost no trajectory information uh, in most of biomeds, and I'll show you some of those data. And then, as I mentioned, few of any of the conditioning variables um, are ever measured, um, and certainly not at a quantitative level that would be useful. Oops. So we were uh, fortunate enough to get a fairly substantial amount of money from Google, uh, AstraZeneca, um, the American Heart Association and Quest Diagnostics. Uh, we've also subsequently gotten uh, additional funding from Apple. Uh, and the core program is called One Brave Idea. I did not come up with the name. I do not think that my ideas are either singular enough or bold enough to merit that title. It was actually the, the name of the competition, um, which thankfully was only 250 word essay. Um, which is about the limit of my uh, writing capabilities. Uh, but our goal was to take the traditional metrics and to move them back uh, much, much closer, so that instead of actually studying late-stage phenomena such as uh, diabetes or, or uh, hypertension, because these are actually the manifestations typically of decades' worth of activity, about 100% of all individuals have coronary disease on CT scan the day they're diagnosed with diabetes. So it's not that diabetes is... Uh, causing atherosclerosis, it causes atherosclerotic events, but they're actually downstream effects of the same fundamental biological processes. So can we take the same type of unbiased strategies in measuring things and do it at the right scale and find the right data that would allow us to uh, impact healthcare? Uh, and ultimately the goal, I think, if you talk to patients, um, if you talk to um, anybody who works with large data sets, if you talk to individuals who are managing the downstream consequences, what almost everybody really uh, is looking for is a set of computable personal outcome trajectories. What they really want is some way to actually identify much, uh, a full spectrum of continuously updating probabilities with a set of predictive outcomes and ideally mechanistic insights uh, that would help us at, uh, at the end of the day. The only way to do this is really to move from where we are at the moment uh, out here. This is what our mode of operation at the moment is in almost all of medicine, with the exception that has to be said of lipids and hypertension, which is important, uh, is expectant care. We sit in our offices and wait for people to show up. Uh, and if you talk to any of the large um, data science companies, they say we would only need, we don't need any medical professionals to be able to completely disintermediate the medical profession. All we need to do is to be able to beat this by an hour, and then we could actually allocate and decide where people go.
Uh, but in fact, what patients want is actually, in fact, they, to be 100% honest, they think this is already happening. I always say most patients think they're getting a detective, but what they're actually getting is a parking attendant when they come in to uh, see a physician. Um, they think that you basically, from the minute that they were born, you've been trying to characterize in, in deep detail um, all of their risks for the rest of their lives, uh, that you're the reason you're not asking them to come back until they're 40 is because they don't have anything going on until they're 40. Uh, and they're absolutely certain uh, until something actually happens to them that you have been uh, almost uh, cat-like watching them for uh, outcomes of an adverse type. What we need to be thinking about is how do we match that expectation in a much more discreet way. And I think uh, probably the two most important things we need to think about are how do we build this in a way that it's patient-centered and holistic. And I would argue, just from my initial statement about how much extra data we actually we need, that we're never going to be able to do that by going through regulatory pipelines, by doing the types of things that we've done with every other endpoint that we've ever characterized. Uh, probably the other thing that I, I think is super important is actually collecting the metadata, which we never do. Uh, we always, um, and I'd show you some examples of this in a minute, but all of the variables that we know about are really physiologic homeostatic variables. So unless you know whereabouts in the system uh, the entire uh, network is positioned, you can't tell if somebody's just responding to an external influence or if they truly have uh, an intrinsic problem. Every Tylenol, every blood pressure pill, every single thing is actually an opportunity to understand that dynamic, but we don't ever record any of that information systematically enough. Sorry. Uh, so uh, we've basically tried to begin to do that in a couple of different areas. I'll, I'll skirt through this very quickly because I know uh, we're short of time, but this was actually uh, the original diagnosis of uh, insulin resistance based on essentially glycosuria. So you're not actually measuring insulin resistance. You're waiting until there's overt glycosuria. Uh, you're looking for other features in the electronic record. Uh, when we did this in a series of highly characterized individuals who actually had uh, um, Dunnigan's partial lipodystrophy, uh, we were able to show abnormalities of not only metabolomics that antedated the diabetes by about a decade and a half, antedated insulin resistance by about a decade, uh, but also capillary abnormalities, uh, distribution of brown adipose tissue, uh, distribution of all adipose tissue in a global MRI, uh, and even uh, nuclear morphology abnormalities in peripheral blood all of which actually uh, were associated with the final phenotype in an almost perfect manner. And then, in fact, one of the things we realized fairly late on, because we had originally been working in laminopathy in the setting of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy with AV block, is that actually the PR interval itself is technically, outside of this setting, is also a manifestation uh, of insulin resistance. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, then building uh, or trying to build a, a series of uh, more broad com computational phenotypes. This was work we did before. We started to work with uh, Google and Apple, uh, really looking at areas of interest. We measured a whole host of responses, uh, electrical responses, because they're fairly high fidelity, things that you could integrate into a clinic. Um, so, for example, auditory evoked responses allow you to parse LVH into amyloid and non-amyloid. They can actually tell the difference uh, between AL and and uh, uh, TTR amyloid. Uh, stride length perfectly discriminates individuals who have LV dysfunction on the basis of non-ischemic from ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then we were able, even um, in later stages of this work, to show uh, that the um, cell biology in a buccal smear represents the cell biology in uh, your right ventricle and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. So it, when we started to look at coronary heart disease, we began to think, where is the literature already? So obviously the retinal phenotypes you've heard about already today. Uh, but if you think about some of the other phenotypes that are associated with really profound abnormalities of the way that we handle our lipids, their macrophage accumulation under uh, the skin, um, xanthalasma, xanth uh, there are abnormalities of uh, responses uh, to a meal in terms of their forearm blood flow that John Deepfield described almost two decades ago, but we've not really characterized those further in a systematic way outside of uh, premature coronary disease or familial hypercholesterolemia. And then we, are, we could also actually look at drug responses, probably the best predictor in almost every statin trial that's ever been done of long-term outcome is the delta to the initial dose. And so those things may actually be biological variables that give us real insight into how a particular system is tuned. Let's see if this works a bit better. There we go. Uh, so what we started then, having done that, realized uh, that there was quite a bit of scope for 
uh, moving the field forward, was ask ourselves, how can we create new phenotypes that are immediately scalable, things that could be deployed in every hospital in the world on the first day? Uh, and so what we began to do is think of uh, traits that select for desired outcomes. You can pick any outcome at all if you pick the right uh, data set, a large enough data set, and you have enough data on outcomes. Uh, we focused on integrated biology and real patients because we figured, as was discussed earlier, that if you can't do this in the real world, you're not going to be able to collect at the right scale. Um, you know, the COVID pandemic is a, a great example of that. 500 million people infected with a disease that lasts about six weeks. Uh, 5 million people died. And almost all the data outside of the um, vaccine trials are in fewer than 20,000 people. And so you, that stunning information mismatch just does not exist in any other sphere of our lives. Not even uh, the church has such a poor data system uh, as the medical profession. Um, we're uh, doing this in a way that deliberately, as I was saying earlier, we're looking for things that are completely new. And the way to look for things that are completely new is to try and uncover them with external stimuli. Uh, that also add, has the benefit of adding metadata that are quantifiable, not just quantifiable at a cellular level, but all the way up to a population level. And so we're typically using drugs and nutrients, small molecules, or physical perturbations. And then finally, we're, we're using a lot of AI not only to train against outcomes that would be critically important, uh, but also to try and understand understand how to extract information from existing data sets that has not previously been available. And the nice things uh, about doing this is it has immediate impact not only in clinical care, um, but also in the short term in um, drug discovery and development. And one of our goals, as you can tell, is if you're going to redesign the entire data stream that you're using, you may as well do it with a purpose. And that purpose would be to bring care delivery translation and uh, discovery all together in a single system uh, so that actually uh, you're being driven by the data you're collecting in real time. Uh, so here's just a couple of examples. Uh, this is work done by my colleague, Rahul Deo, as part of One Brave Idea, uh, basically dissecting using completely unsupervised learning heart failure into uh, somewhere around 14 different subclasses. Uh, you can do it in lots of different ways. He's built a, an end-to-end -end algorithm that interprets uh, a multi-view echo, but you can also extract almost all of the information necessary off a single 2D uh, apical uh, view of either four chamber or two chamber doesn't really matter. And in the in the bottom, you can see um, metrics for ejection fraction, for uh, global longitudinal strain, uh, for uh, HCM detection, and for amyloid detection, all with AUCs over 0.89. Uh, some of them, uh, these are the first pass AUCs. You can go much much broader. Uh, we also did some work, um, which you might imagine was related to some of our other funders looking at age predicted versus biological age from a single EDCG. Turns out the ECG is actually a very powerful way of predicting your age. If you do a 12 EDCG, you can predict somebody's age to uh, plus or minus six months. Um, interestingly, however, it's also possible to predict uh, biological age, not just chronological age. And so this mismatch may end up being a really powerful uh, piece of technology. Uh, we also uh, began to look at behavioral disturbances by looking at activity metrics pre and post the lockdown. Uh, so you can actually see how robust and rhythmic uh, activity burn is in, um, this is a population of over 100,000 individuals uh, on the left. And as soon as the lockdown began, you can see all of these populations begin to uh, um, reclassify themselves. So what we're doing at the moment is trying to understand what is it about each of those uh, exercise patterns uh, that actually tells us useful information of peop about people's biology, about their sociology, uh, and ultimately about how we can then manage uh, their care or interventions in their care more uh, productively. Um, we've, we've done a lot of work uh, with AI to maximize, maximize content yield. We've now uh, built platform approaches to the HR. The uh, Mass General Brigham uh, spent a billion and a half dollars uh, on an electronic record, um, which now has about 10 million individuals in it. Uh, but it's still subject to all of the core problems that every digital health record is, which is the data entry folks are actually all sitting in the room. Uh, and we're not... Uh, given any additional time to enter data. Most of the data is subjective or semi-subjective, and we haven't really spent much time uh, trying to uh, build workflows that allow us to categorize things. And so this is an opportunity, actually, to just discard some of the things that we are holding onto ourselves 
use that time for other things, use the data for other things. And so this is partly why we've begun to build uh, a lot of real-time trajectory analyses, real-time uh, uh, data streams of things that are available in the general public, things that patients are already collecting on themselves, whether they're patients or not. This allows you to do a couple of things. It allows you to federate all the learning to the individual's devices. Uh, it lets you uh, tokenize the data at source. That means you can begin to use use specific consent, so I can give you my data, and I can tell you what I'm willing to let you do with it. I can change it anytime you want. Uh, it also uh, ultimately is super useful for transparency, and I think this will ultimately be the mode by which academics and industry end up collaborating, is when you have real rigorous data collection, real rigorous data audit, a lot of the conflicts dissipate fairly quickly. Uh, obviously, it's not perfect, and we need to think about it quite carefully, but in, in general terms, that's uh, very much uh, the case. Uh, I'm going to show you one a very brief experiment to show you what, what we did was uh, we actually, uh, uh, anybody who knows me will uh, know that I spent a lot of time in rare disease genetics. I spent a lot of time in, uh, in genome-wide association studies, but I always thought that the real meat was going to be in the middle. And that's because uh, when Mendel first described genetics in peas, that's where he found the real meat. It's actually when you move plants, when you expose them to stimuli, you actually see the genetics that are latent revealed. And so what we built was a platform that had discovery and validation capabilities intrinsically based, low, scalable, low-cost uh, assays uh, with perturbations, and ideally doing it in all you have to do is train the models against clinically relevant outcomes, and you get really robust uh, and very useful data, and I'll show you one very quick example. Uh, so you can add small molecules to peripheral blood. 95% of all the CBCs in the planet are done with a one technology, which is a small flow cytometer. We downcode it. They measure probably 100 things, 100 parameters, um, with a couple of commercially available dyes. Um, they downcode all that data to a traditional uh, CBC, complete bug count. Uh, we added a set of small molecules. You get completely new phenotypes. You can see this cellular group out here is just not simply represented in the baseline. Uh, you can then take that, train it against the outcomes that are necessary. Most importantly, it has very large effect size genetics. So you can, instead of getting 1.1, 1.2x uh, genetic effects, you get 10x genetic effects, which actually end up being Mendelian. And just to show you that this is possible, uh, you can use it almost immediately to stratify. So here's uh, a new phenotype that we used in, in our EMR, and you can see how beautifully it doesn't do very much for diabetes in general, doesn't do very much for chronic kidney disease or gout, it beautifully stratifies gestational diabetes. And this is a, a, a very powerful uh, biomarker that we know the genetics of, that we can actually work out the mechanism for within a matter of a few weeks. Uh, here's one specific example. I threw this in at the last moment. This is uh, actually uh, an example that shows you how diseases themselves can influence the outcome of those same diseases. I'm always a little bit wary of Mendelian randomization for that specific cause, that you're trying to randomize against an initial event when the downstream events may actually never have been captured in your end phenotype. And so this is one where we looked at uh, peripheral blood, looked at uh, ionic transients. We we're able to find, uh, although it doesn't project very well, uh, a dramatic elevation in the calcium transient in relation to a piezo-1 activator, Yoda-1. Uh, that piezo-1 activator uh, was associated, as you might imagine, with a piezo-1 locus. When we mapped the piezo-1 locus, it was strongly associated with thrombosis in diabetics. It's also strongly associated with thrombosis uh, in COVID, and it's very strongly associated, in fact, universally present uh, in individuals who've had a hypercoagulability screen that was negative, uh, which um, is actually quite an interesting uh, set of patients. But this is a mechanical stimulus that even in the presence of full anticoagulation leads to thrombosis, uh, and it's present in about 25% of diabetics. Uh, interestingly, uh, what we now know the mechanism, this is in uh, press, uh, but uh, we know that what it actually is, is that high glucose itself selects for populations of bone marrow cells that drive your entire uh, peripheral blood and your endothelium to this high piezo one expressing state to make you uniquely sensitive to mechanical stimuli. So you can imagine this is the type of thing that would be very useful in terms of trying to predict uh, either the use of uh, antithrombotics or uh, the uh, preparation for risk uh, in the setting of mechanical forces.
Um, you can also do a whole host of things predicting drug effects. You can see here, uh, we took all the known drugs, we tested them in one assay, and you add just with that single assay, you can add uh, something like uh, an entire standard deviations worth of improved information content. Uh, obviously, there's lots of ways this could go along. And one of the most important things I think about big data and analytics is thinking about how are you going to build in the direct experimental validation. And that actually in terms of clinical care, as Brian referred to this morning, really uh, directly implies, in fact, it mandates that we have to build the systems in the real world, because unless we're, we're optimizing this in real time, none of it will ever actually work. Um, and so uh, I'm going to basically spend now a couple of minutes on uh, these um, intel building of intelligent systems and how we've gone to, about trying to do that. Uh, this won't take long, and then I'll, I'll finish up with a couple of general comments. Uh, but um, essentially, the intelligent systems that exist outside medicine are really powerful. Uh, this is uh, just one example, the Uber tech stack. Uh, you can see two important things. One, uh, that the information is delivered to the end user, not, by, not to somebody who's then making the decision. Uh, and that's critically important. There should not be an intermediary. Any, anybody who tells you they're going to give AI to a clinician who's then going to act on it doesn't understand how AI will work uh, because ultimately the core problem with that is that uh, then all of the variation that exists in clinical care is reintroduced at the point of delivery. And that's the core problem. Almost nobody has ever been able to get almost any clinical decision support to actually work. Uh, so what you need in, in the long term are high volume, high velocity, high diversity data inputs. You don't need to make any assumptions. One of the biggest problems I think we face in medicine is we assume we know what data we're going to need. A structured algorithmic outputs in a closed loop system, continuous AI driven optimization for measured outcomes. We won't get it right the first time. We will get it right if we iteratively experiment and A-B test. Uh, and ideally you want to do this with opt out human involvement so that people are not being discriminated against. Uh, but that's going to be a fairly Herculean task in its own right. What's different in medicine are all the things I've talked about. Um, no biological transactional data. The, the data tell us more about our clinic schedules or about who's running the MRI scanner than they do about what the actual biology of the patient. Um, we have this um, horrendous focus on artisanal variable intervention. We classify that as personalization. Uh, what it is, is personalization for us, the majority of people, as you heard today, drugs that have been in the guidelines for 30 years, only 50% of people are even uh, taking them on a routine basis. It's much worse for most drugs. It's much worse for, uh, um, for systems that are not as uh, systematically organized as the NHS, I can assure you. Uh, pharmacology is, is discovered in a completely separate industry, nowhere else on the planet. Uh, does that occur? And then finally, we talk about analytics, but at the end of the day, what we do is build consensus through committees. And that ultimately is the core problem. We're building guidelines of tiny misrepresentative populations. What we should be doing is building systems that optimize locally uh, for the people that you're actually managing. Um, it's super tough to change, don't get me wrong. We, we I was telling Adrian last night that uh, the um, use of guideline-directed medical therapy at the Brigham uh, for heart failure, uh, the comprehensive use of all GDMT-driven medications was 2.5% of people with reduced DF. We were actually initially afraid uh, to publish that, and we realized it was best in class because nationwide, most people are on actually pediatric doses of ACE inhibitors uh, and massive doses of diuretic and pediatric doses of beta blocker. That's the fundamental strategy. If you look at heart failure patients, I think it's the same in the UK, I haven't seen the data recently, but 100% of all heart failure patients who get admitted to hospitals, in, at least in Boston, um, but I think it's actually pretty widely known, that what happens is their vasodilators, beta blocker doses go down, their diuretic dose goes up. The only drug that has never been associated with dose-dependent survival, uh, in fact, it's only been negatively associated with it, is the only drug that gets modified in that setting. Um, so the, the missing link is actually a learning system for uh, transactions. And so what we did was, this is just another reference to how poor 22% uh, of diabetics have all three um, and goals managed, at least in 2016. I think there are more recent data that are just above 20%. Uh, but what we realized was the clinical workflow is completely broken. So what happens is it's all dependent on a series of transactions with a system that patients themselves could easily readily manage if they were given the information just at the right time in the right way. Uh, and so what we basically did was to take lipids and blood pressure because they're obviously 24, 25% of, uh, of the population. Uh, they're 
preventative, so they need to be done in a rigorous way when there's no symptoms. It's a really good place to think about building a system like this. We have done the same for diabetes, for heart failure, uh, for a whole host of much more complicated conditions. Uh, but what we recognized was that because care was episodic with few touch points, you end up with very limited drug titration and very poor control. In fact, when you ask patients in the US, I'm not sure if it's the same here, why they don't take their blood pressure medications or their cholesterol medications, they say, well, the next time that the doctor asked to see me was nine months from now. So I didn't think it was that big a deal. They are actually calibrating how important it is based on how we think uh, it's important. Uh, and we're not giving them the right information. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, the data on, for example, LDL are identical in Boston as they are in, in the data that were presented here. Uh, what we did was essentially break all of clinical care into this massive algorithm. So lipid management is about 1,500 subroutines. Uh, blood pressure is much more complex. Uh, and what we did was to build it in a data model that allowed us to capture baseline, measure the intervention and the responses, in every single step of the way, so that you actually end up with, in, that, in essence, uh, a set of biological transactions, uh, not just a series of dose changes or prescriptions. What we also did was build in a way to be done in a collaborative care agreement, so it lets non-licensed personnel, it was actually designed to allow patients to do it themselves, uh, and the AI backbone actually learns in real time and uh, updates the clinical model. It's applicable to about 50% of all uh, medical care, um, it's certainly primary and secondary care. Obviously, it's less straightforward in inpatient settings, although there, as you probably know, the single biggest predictor of what people are getting in an inpatient is the change of shift. That's when drugs are most likely uh, to be modulated is when the staff change. Uh, what we showed was that you could pull essentially almost all of these transactions into an interaction with a computer. Uh, you can modulate that in the elderly individuals who are not digitally capable. Uh, you can do it through any modality, any channel, text, phone, um, even a flip phone uh, or an old dial phone, uh, smartphone, uh, laptop, computer. And what we basically found was that by building this, we've tested it now in over 10,000 patients, building it much more widely. Uh, by combining clinical know-how, AI, and test shifting, uh, you were able to dramatically accelerate control. We have 96% of people at goal for almost any endpoint. I can show you the data in a minute for blood pressure and lipids, um, but uh, it works reproducibly for almost anything. Uh, lowers costs and dramatically changes uh, the way in which clinicians are performing. Uh, and these are the data basically that were published in circulation and in JAMA cardiology, but for lipids, 40% uh, reduction in LDL, blood pressure 20 uh, millimeter of mercury reduction in systolic, a 13 millimeter reduction in diastolic. You'll notice very little in the way of additional meds. And the main reason was just dramatic improvements in adherence because of the fact, and fine tuning of dosing, uh, because of the fact that this was now a priority. Uh, and so within 12 weeks, uh, we have everybody at goal. Within two weeks, we can identify the individuals who have secondary hypertension based on the responses to the meds and a couple of simple labs. Uh, and then by eight weeks, we can identify uh, the majority of individuals who are going to need referral. Ultimately, what, uh, the, one of the benefits of these types of closed-loop platforms is they do allow you to integrate discovery and tra translational uh, uh, aspects of medicine much more clearly with the real world. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do is to build a platform that can not only generate new targets, but actually understand those targets in the real world as the drugs are being developed, and then identify the individuals who are best likely to respond to those drugs, uh, and ideally also then be able to systematically expand uh, in populations without having to do massive pivotal phase three trials in every setting. How do you put it all together? Well, I, I think that's going to be the real challenge because, as I mentioned, the biggest problem with big data is we all need to stop, uh, let go of small data. We also need to realize that none of this will happen without massive teams. The traditional academic model is very poorly um, um, suited to this uh, because it's based on individual uh, outputs and not on uh, team outputs in the main. Uh, but ultimately, we can begin to use a whole host of new disease entities, a whole host of new trial strategies in the context of these uh, learning health systems. I do not believe that AI will ever actually be able to undertake causal inference on its own. We're still going to have to do, uh, because simply because of the fact that where you're using artificial intelligence is usually because the unknown unknowns vastly outweigh the known 
unknowns. And that means you're definitely going to have to use an intervention to systematically address it. And ultimately, all of this is a function of the data return cycle. So if you're not collecting the right data, you're not deploying it in the right places, none of this will happen. Two last slides. We need to totally change how we educate the entire medical profession. Uh, I think uh, it was Brian who said we, we don't want to have uh, GP uh, coders, and that's probably true, but we also don't want to have coding done without uh, some biomedical involvement. Uh, we've learned that the hard way. We need to be able to educate patients. We need everybody to be participating in shared decision-making. There really is an opportunity to redesign the entire system, and I do think that there are going to be a whole host of new roles for individuals. I, you may have seen the article in The Economist last week where economics as an academic field has almost disappeared because the theoretical local activities were replaced by massive data in real time, and only three or four of the main economists are participating in that effort. And then finally, what we believe you need to be able to do is to unlock and unblock this uh, evolution of care delivery. We've got this massive incoming wave of new uh, drugs, new mechanisms, uh, new specialty care, things are moving into the home. And at the moment, everything is stuck in primary care. And if unless we start to think about how we move things more systematically, we're never going to be able to do this. And what we need is system-driven care delivery. And uh, what I'm arguing is that if we are going to do that in medicine with the right scale of data that we need, we're going to have to start to break down the traditional architecture. Even, even the NHS in Scotland is not going to be large enough to make the inferences you would need to manage patients in Scotland. That's really the key. And in fact, one of the things that we've seen emerging in the States is this massive effort to redefine where uh, met care gets delivered. Almost all of the large retail chains, all of the pharmacy chains, um, CVS just announced a massive clinical trial unit. All of these things are happening in real time. And so I think a lot of the venues in which care are delivered, a lot of the people participating in care are going to end up being community-based or family-based or patients themselves, rather than the things that we have uh, invested a lot of time and energy in. So we need to change the data collect. we collect. We need to scale by several log orders. We need to start to think outside the, the work that we control. We need to think about how data that are being collected in the real world are actually uh, important for medical decision making. I think the, one of the best examples there is a randomized trial of heart for looking at a thousand individuals of wearables and home devices, none of which impacted readmission rates. Uh, the only thing that predicted readmission rate with a short enough time cycle to actually act on it was telephone chatter. So if you knew what somebody's baseline communication was and it went up or down, if they had heart failure, that was a better predictor of readmission than your PA pressure and a cardiomaps. So we need to really think about how it is we're excluding and including data. We need to uh, create intelligent systems by giving up the less intelligent parts of medicine to systems. Um, we need to close the loop, as I mentioned. We need to rethink how we allow medicine to be evolving. It should be data-driven, broadly and not driven by individual careers or individual uh, uh, anythings, really. Uh, we need to make it less about us before somebody else does. And I can assure you uh, from having worked with a lot of the tech companies, uh, they are absolutely certain that medicine is the place they're going next. Um, and ultimately, uh, there's going to be a whole range of new roles for physicians. And ultimately, um, the only real design constant in all of this is the biology of disease. And that's essentially what the biomedical professions are expert in, is the biology of disease. So we all have jobs for the future. We just need to make sure we don't end up like travel agents being disintermediated uh, by the data flows. So I need to acknowledge, uh, obviously, the sponsors uh, of my work, uh, which I already have done, One Brave Idea, the Apple Heart Movement Study, Rahul Deo, who's really a spectacular data scientist, um, we were talking earlier about integrating with uh, regulators, and I'm uh, grateful that uh, one of our close collaborators, Rob Califf, has just been nominated as the FDA commissioner, but really a whole host of folks who've been incredibly uh, supportive and working together as a large team. Uh, and I think that, at the end of the day, is probably the single biggest lesson. So thank you for your attention, and apologies for going a little long. Professor McCray, really, thank you very much, and I'm sure that the huge online audience Love that. We do a moment for questions because, yeah, I left five minutes early for the, the end of the meeting. Any thoughts from, from, from the audience? Because, Callum, with, with a way of um, sort of sweeping new number of variables on that you would measure, but there's lots and lots of new phenotypes to go in. 
because what we've we've evolved for 102 years to measure blood pressure, cholesterol, whatnot, and we intervene and we've measured that. We know the outcome predicts benefit or not. Yep. How long will it take this acquisition of huge data for us to learn where we're going to make new interventions, which will then affect outcome? How long do you think that will take? Well, so I think by by changing the scale, you also shorten that time. So that was one of the reasons we deliberately built. I don't want to um, throw away the last 200 years of biomedical advances. We deliberately built everything uh, on the existing platform so that you're using complete blood counts because they're being recorded at very regularly in different settings. Uh, for example, 143 million people get a complete blood count in, uh, with one company in North America. So you, you have the ability then to be able to make fairly simple interventions. And many of these will be, as we were talking about um, with Brian this morning, they're going to end up being nutritional or environmental early on rather than pharmacologic. So we will have time and effort to be able to uh, understand how responses to drugs uh, can be characterized in the same system as which they're currently being delivered. So another point, you, you showed the, you gave the example in people with diabetes that you identified in the, that COVID crisis, that subgroup of people that were prone to thrombosis. And then, so what's the next, what, that, that's one, what's the next area you're going to come out with uh, that's novel and dynamic and going to change the way we, we approach medicine? So that, that was the first one. Let's give the second one. That, so there are 150 of those, oh. I'm afraid. Just new one. That was, so what we did was we picked, and I, I just to give you a sense of the scale. So the nice thing about doing things in an unbiased fashion is you can select the things that meet the goals that you would like to achieve. So what we did was we basically, uh, using about 35 chemical perturbations in the complete blood count and uh, the um, uh, ionic uh, transient assays in peripheral blood, we were able to create about 10 to the 16 phenotypes. So then what we did was we said, okay, we've got 10 to the 16 phenotypes in whatever, you know, 8,000 people. What we'll do is select for those that have big genetic signal. Uh, when we train against a direct model that is useful, i.e. a set of outcomes that are important, we'll uh, select those. And by using that funnel, we got down to about 150. And so, for example, we have um, a um, heart failure phenotype, uh, so modifier of all existing heart failure, uh, genetic loci and ischemic heart failure. Uh, that was undetected in traditional studies, but when you use AI to identify a very specific feature that predicts heart failure admission in the subsequent year, it comes out with uh, a 7x effect size. You can then map and clone it. We already have the gene. We've already built the model. We're looking uh, to try and develop drugs uh, that suppress that modification. It is the future. It is medicine. Professor Cray, Chief of Cardiology at Brigham and Professor of Medicine at Harvard, thank you for coming to Edinburgh for a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.